Welcome to First Thursdays. I think we're going to get started here. Thank you so much for being here. I see a few new faces. Again, this is First Thursday with Sustainable Tulsa, and uh, we appreciate you being here with us today, and we're really excited about today. It's on solar and uh, what's going on uh, over in Stillwater, another part of our state. So we're looking forward to hearing about that. But um, I first, I want to thank our sponsors, and PSO is our lead sponsor for First Thursday. We appreciate your support, Carrie. And all right, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I uh, also want to thank our other sponsors as well, which is Cavanta, TCC, uh, Creativity Center, PSO Wind Choice as well, Grog's Green Barn. Thank you, Kelly. And One Oak. we got the whole One Oak team over here, so thank you for being here. And Save Our Streams. So let's give them all a round of applause. I also want to thank my board members that are here today with us and supporting. We have Carrie Rowland, Stephanie Cameron, uh, Mike Teague, Matt Newman, and Aaron Larder. Please give them a round of applause for their leadership. And of course, today could not happen without my wonderful team. Uh, Megan Hurley has just joined the team, events and uh, marketing coordinator. Jill Maud at the table back there, the sign in, and Sarah Hicks. And we also have Bridget here who's volunteering. So let's thank them for their time today. Um, again, just reminding you, there is recycling and full sun composting. Thank you, Dawn, for being here. Provides the bins. You can do it, too. So um, it's always good to compost. So thank you to full sun composting for that. And that TCC is recycling. We love that. Um, so, uh, so our next First Thursday will be here uh, at the Center for Creativity. It will be uh, on the 1st September. Uh, first uh, Thursday of September, and we'll be honoring the uh, National Drive Electric Week. And um, we'll have an opportunity here from INCOG and PSO uh, to share with us about what's been going on. Right now, they're installing a lot of electric or the charging stations across the state. And so we'll get to hear a little bit about how that's going and some of the next steps. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, our October one will be a special treat. We weren't able to stay in here, so we got creative, and Megan was awesome to coordinate coordinate an opportunity. So we're going to have it on first Thursday in October. Um, so that'll be October 3rd, but it'll be at 6 p.m. And we're going to be uh, meeting at Heirloom Rustic Ales. Ales. And um, so, hey, that'll be a little different for us. So do you want to come tell them just a little bit about that? And, uh, and maybe um, also tell them a little bit about uh, Recharge. All right, so hey guys, I'm Megan. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, so Heirloom Rustic Ales actually uh, has some sustainability pr uh, practices within their brewery. And so we're kind of trying out to see what an evening first Thursday will be like. Uh, they're gonna have a food truck present. They're gonna give us a tour. And uh, just like we have for our lunchtime, we will have a pre-order uh, registration for some of their uh, brewery uh, brews on tap. So um, it's going to be super fun, and we hope that you come out. And we're, we're hoping that more people will come out to invite your friends that can't make it during the lunch hour, but can come at 6 p.m. It's a fun place. It's got some outdoor seating as well. So uh, I'm really excited. Jake Miller is going to be giving us the tour. And there's some really cool stuff we learned when we met with him last week. So and then I'm going to talk to you about recharge. So you see these lovely slides behind me. 
We have an exciting fundraiser, and this isn't just about like, hey, come give us your money. Yes, we love money, because we get to do all of these cool programs with that money. So that's why we do these fundraisers. But Corey is a big, big supporter of having fun. And so we have, uh, we have Calliope Youth Circus. They're gonna be there. They're gonna be doing some really cool entertainment, fun flips and crazy circus acts. Uh, we have Grasshopper, who's gonna be uh, playing for us for the first hour while you're getting food and drinks. And then our MC for the evening is Angela Evans. And she is a, a OK So Story Slam winner, as well as a, a Tulsa food critic writer. And she's super fun and bubbly. And then our catering this year, we have uh, the Reserve, which will be doing the VIP. So if you're a VIP or you want to be, Reserve is going to be uh, treating you to some appetizers in there. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, K Gusto and a Green Zebra Bowl that will also be catering for us. So it's an exciting event. We have our Facebook uh, event is live. So go on there, click and buy a ticket. Or if you want to sponsor it, Corey can talk to you about sponsorships after our event today. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and also, um, we have our scorecard final event, which is going to be August 22nd, and that will be uh, will be at Gilcrease, and that's where an opportunity we'll be celebrating all of our scorecard members. So our scorecard program, in brief, is a triple bottom line strategy that we offer the community. We have over 60 companies that are engaged right now, and we're looking to see that grow, but come and be a part of that and hear um, what our members are doing. I see a few coaches out there and members uh, that have been working really hard this year on their sustainable practices. So uh, anyway, we're excited about that. Um, one more thing. Um, yes, if you're interested in having a booth with First Thursday, uh, we've had a lot of interest in that. So Megan, see Megan after this, and we'll see if your booth would relate to her upcoming speakers, and, and she'll get you signed up for that, because there, there's a lot of interest. And it is free to have a booth at Par First Thursday, because it's a way to really engage our community and our members to be able to see what all the wonderful things are going on out there and the people that are doing it. So that's important. Um, before we get started, we're going to do something we've been doing uh, Really, when we started First Thursday, we used to pass the mic because there was 40 people in the room. Actually, there was 10 to begin with, expanded to 40, and now we're somewhere between 70 and 100, depending on um, which First Thursday we're talking about. So we can't do that anymore, right? But what we can do is a two-minute get to know somebody you haven't met yet. So we want you to stand up, introduce yourself to somebody you have not met, you want to meet, you've seen, or you've never seen before, but take two minutes and get to know each other. Thanks.
go tell her. Wonderful. You guys are great at it. Thank you. And resume those conversations afterwards as well. Um, <laughs> Okay, one more thing we're gonna do before our guest speaker today. Um, I'm gonna invite Rick Katarski to come forward. Thank you guys, I love new friendships, I love it. Uh, Rick Katarski's gonna tell us about an upcoming very important event and then we're gonna get started. All right, Rick. Hi, thank you, I'm Rick Katarski, I'm the Curator of Wildlife Conservation and Scientific Advancement at the Tulsa Zoo. And I just wanted to make an announcement about an event that's coming up through uh, Okies for Monarchs, if you've heard of that organization. It's an initiative of the Co Oklahoma Monarch and Pollinator Collaborative. Uh, they want to invite you to join a conservationist from across the state for rewilding Oklahoma. It's a long, uh, day-long symposium highlighting Oklahoma's successes and future goals in pollinator conservation. This event is going to be Wednesday, August 28th, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and it's going to be located at the Oklahoma City Zoo. There's going to be an acclaimed author, Benjamin Voigt, will be delivering a keynote address and will be available to autograph copies of his new book, A New Garden Ethic, Cultivating Defiant Compassion for an Uncertain Future. The cost is uh, $70. Registration includes a catered box lunch and there will be vendors across the state with materials and ways to engage in pollinator conservation in here in Oklahoma. Uh, this is a green event, so please, if you, if you attend, bring a sustainable and personal beverage container for yourself. There will be water and tea available, and bring your own writing tools or smart devices to take notes. If you're interested, you can go to okiesformonarchs.org and check out more information and get registered. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Rick. Okay. So, um, Today I had the pleasure of inviting Daniel Thrasher to come and share with you. Uh, we had an opportunity to come and visit their space uh, just this last year, and it's amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're doing tours. I hope I didn't set you up here, but okay, you're doing tours. Um, but it's just so beautiful uh, just to see how it's working, and they've got so many other projects they're working on, so he's going to be sharing with you. But uh, Daniel, he's been serving as the Executive Vice President of Business Development and Marketing for Central Electric Cooperative. Daniel Thrasher brings 20 years of customer engagement and marketing experience to the central team. His responsibilities for the central team include member experience, community joining, uh, engagement, media relations, and serving as a primary contact for key cooperative accounts. Prior to joining the team, Daniel spent 12 years in the banking industry, mostly re recently serving as the regional vice president of Bank SNB, overseeing retail banking in northern Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado. Daniel is a graduate of Oklahoma State University and in 2014 was named one of Stillwater's top 10 emerging leaders under 40 by uh, the Stillwater Young Professionals. Way to go. Um, outside of serving as member for Central, Daniel is also an active member of the Stillwater Area Community, serving on the board of directors for the Stillwater Chamber of Commerce and the Oklahoma Wondertorium, and a board president of the Cole School Foundation. So an active member of his community. Let's welcome Daniel. Thank you, Corey, for that introduction. I'm going to get a little bit set up here. Um, and it's great to be in Tulsa again. When I worked for Bank SNB, I had the opportunity to work in this market uh, quite a bit. And my parents actually uh, were or live, my father works here in Tulsa, and uh, they have an apartment here. And so I get the opportunity to come to Tulsa a lot to visit them. And unfortunately, on the way up, I remembered I forgot to call my mom and tell her I would be in town today. So. I'm probably in trouble when she finds out, so please don't tell her, but uh, I'll let her know on the way back, I guess. But um, it's really good to be here today and, and really enjoy the chance to speak to you about what we're doing at Central Electric Cooperative, how we're trying to engage our communities and trying to educate our members about opportunities with new technology that, uh, that we have available to us. And it's a pleasure to be here in Tulsa to do that. And as Corey said, we had the opportunity to host Sustainable Tulsa, I think it was about this time last summer, and talk about the projects and the initiatives you have going on in this community. And it's great to see um, all the work that's going on through this group. So it's an honor for me to be able to be here today and speak to you. 
So I'd like to start off by asking, uh, and this is a question I ask most groups I speak to, how many in the room are either currently a member of an electric cooperative or have ever been a member of an electric cooperative? So yeah, you, you know, about you know, 10, 15 hands go up. That's typical of what we see when we talk to these groups. My hand was up as well. So I grew up a member of an electric cooperative, actually the cooperative I work for now, Central Electric Cooperative. And then my wife and I, our first home after college was on Central Electric Cooperative line. So about 22, 23 years of my 37 years on this planet, I've been, we've received my power from an electric cooperative. So when I went to work at Central Electric, I thought, well, you know, I've, I've been an electric cooperative member that long. I, I should know everything there is to know about electric cooperatives, right? But quickly learned I knew about that much about electric uh, cooperatives and also the industry as a whole. And so the last two and a half years that I've been at Central, it's been a great experience to learn and, and to be a part of this industry and to see the, the chances we have to really make a difference uh, not only in our communities, but as the, as the industry of a whole. So I'd like to take a few minutes before I, I dig into solar and talk about how we're utilizing solar on our campus and really introduce you to who our cooperative is. So at Central Electric Cooperative, we serve 2,000 square miles in central Oklahoma, which is larger than the states of Delaware and Rhode Island. And so, again, those are small states, but just to give you an idea of the service area, uh, service area we serve, we're based in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and that's where the majority of our membership is located. We have a bit, little over 30% of our members are in and around the Stillwater, Oklahoma area. We serve a little bit inside city limits, but mostly outside city limits. We also have a lot of growth between Stillwater and Perkins. I just met somebody who has a family farm uh, here in the room uh, that has a family farm in that, that area. They're probably a central member. We also have a lot of growth between Guthrie and Edmond, so in southern Logan County, northern Oklahoma County. So inside this territory, we serve 28 different communities or cities. We have members that have addresses in large metro areas like Oklahoma City and Edmond, and then we have members that live in communities like Meridian, Oklahoma, which has less than 100 people uh, in their community. So we, we serve a wide range of individuals, both rural and both urban, and so when we develop policies and procedures when we think about the future and where we need to go, we have to keep all that in mind and how we serve that, that wide uh, variety of population. So again, to, to give you another illustration of just how large we are in such a small area, we have 4,500 miles of line. So if you were to leave Stillwater, drive all the way out to LA, drive up to Seattle, down to Salt Lake, over to Denver, back to Salina, Kansas, and then back down to Stillwater, that's 4,500 miles of line. So that's how much line our team has to maintain, has to develop, has to keep going uh, inside that 2,000 square miles. And just another fun fact, as an electric cooperative, our statewide, our, our group of collective as a whole, we serve in each of the 77 counties in Oklahoma. And if you added up the miles of line that we serve, it actually totals more than the investor-owned utilities and the munis municipalities here in the state of Oklahoma. So even if you didn't raise your hand and you haven't been yourself been a member of an electric cooperative, chances are you've been served by an electric cooperative in some way, either a business or somebody you know, your, your employees. Somebody has benefited from the quality of life that an electric cooperative can provide. So uh, the economic development driver that we are in the state of Oklahoma is a very important part of what we do. And we manage that with an eight-person board that is elected by the members. We have 80 employees, and then we serve over 20,000 homes and businesses in that area. There's actually a little over 21,000 meters that we serve in that area. So it's a responsibility we take greatly. It's one that uh, we are very proud to serve there in central Oklahoma and very proud to represent these 20,000 plus members uh, that we get to work with on a daily basis. So when you think of an electric co-op, this is probably some of the images you think of. I know for me, it's some of the images in my mind uh, when I thought about uh, utilities and electricity. Um, the picture um, in the winter storm, I'm not allowed to say the I word. That's something I learned uh, really quickly learning, uh, working at electric co-op. We can't say the word that starts with I and ends with CE. They don't allow that word to be said. So we all only talk about winter storms, um, but that's a winter storm with some damage um, that, uh, that's an illustration. And then also you see some of our crews working in a spring storm with a pole that was uh, damaged during a spring thunderstorm. So those are images you probably think of with an electric cooperative. You probably also think of these images. You think of linemen out working and, and maintaining the line, and you also think of office personnel 
that provides you great member experience or great customer service. And that's an area that, that's one of the areas that I'm responsible for at our electric co-op and making sure that our members get a great experience. But some areas that you may not think about or some areas that are really getting uh, heavily involved, and I know our partners here with other utilities would, would say this too, is the technology that's coming into the utility industry. And you may look at an electric co-op and may think it's not a very innovative industry, or you may think it's been the same way for 80, 80, 80 years and we just serve poles and wires and that's it, but that's definitely not the case. These are some actual pictures of our employees working in our system operations center. Um, so that's, as I'm looking at it, the top left-hand corner. Um, Larry Gordon is actually one of those employees, and he's been with our, our co-op for over 30 years. But he has embraced the technology that we have provided him to be able to learn more about our system, to look at the data that comes in off of our system. And something he likes to say is, I can take this information, I can look at this data, and I can prevent tomorrow's outages today. I can make sure to send crews to the right spot to do work that hopefully would keep an outage in the future at a minimum. And it's great to hear that from somebody who's been in the industry for so long, but is so accepting of these tools and new technology we provide. Then you see Jonathan Knowles, he's actually got a, a computer in his hands. We, we provide all of our linemen and all of our field uh, teams with laptops and tablets. So when they're out in the field, they have access to technology wherever they're at. Sometimes we don't always have internet access where, where we're at, but they do have that technology with them at all times and need to be able to use it. And then finally, the other picture you see is one of our drones. We've heavily invested in UAV technology and find that that's been a great tool to have for us um, at the electric co-op. In fact, this past spring, when we had record flooding, we had an instance where we couldn't get to a member. The roads around them were all flooded or impassable, and it was too dangerous to send our crews in either on foot or even by boat. So we were able to use one of our drones and fly into the area and to be able to see what was causing the outage before we could ever get anybody into that uh, area. And so what that did is that, that shortened the outage time. So by the time we could get a truck in there and we could get a crew in there to work, they knew exactly what was wrong. They had all the equipment they needed to be able to help that member and get them back online. So these technologies are a big part of who we are and, and what we do at Central and something, again, that we take great pride in with our employees and having them integrate into their daily use. And so on that note, and really kind of getting into the key point of what I'm here to talk about today is, you may say as an electric co-op, uh, why would you all be interested in some of these new technologies or even being able to use solar? I mean, don't you sell electricity? So why would you want to encourage somebody to be off the grid or to not uh, utilize traditional pole and wire service? Well, that really goes back to the culture of innovation and the culture of, of really striving to learn more and to be better and to answer members' questions. We have definitely been getting more and more mem members asking us, what's solar all about? How can I use it? Can I lower my electric bill? You know, does it work? And so while for us, using solar on our campus helps us answer those questions, and I'll be able to show you more of that in the few, uh, here in just a few minutes. We've also begun to invest into electric vehicles. Um, I know some of our utility partners in the room will probably agree with this. This could be the next big load for us. This could be that next thing that, um, that we see more and more of our members and our customers using. Um, I have Ray Chambers here with me, who I know some of you, Ray, raise your hand in, in the back, uh, who some of you have met. Uh, I brought Ray because he's the solar expert. And so when you guys start asking hard questions that I don't know the answer to, I'll point you to Ray. But, um, but we rode over today in an electric vehicle, and in our, in our, we have a Tesla Model X. And we have two charging stations on our campus, and we are now seeing at least two to three cars stop every week to charge there in southern Stillwater. The city of Stillwater has noticed this, and they're actually getting ready to install five charging stations in the city of Stillwater. I know here in Tulsa, through Sustainable Tulsa and NCOG and other groups, you guys have embraced charging stations. So... That's another thing that we're investing in and really trying to, to look at. But again, back to solar. In 2009, this is where this discussion really began for Central Electric Cooperative. Our leadership team and board at the time had decided the current facility they were in wasn't adequate for future growth. And after doing feasibility studies, learned that the chances of, of that building being able to, uh, to expand or to renovate far outweighed the cost of building a new energy efficient location. 
So in 2009, that process started for Central Electric, and over the next several years, they began to research what should we do? What should we do with the new building? And in that period of time, uh, fortunately, a piece of property came available exactly across the street from where our old location was. And so our board was able to purchase that property. And in 2016, we moved into this location that you see on the bottom of the screen. It's on the southern side of Stillwater. So if you ever come to town and you take Highway 33 and take, go through Perkins and take Highway 177 into Stillwater, uh, you'll see our building right there on the entryway into Stillwater. We really tried to transform what that looked like as you're coming into the Stillwater community. And as I said earlier, we also had members asking us about renewables, solar, wind, hydro, uh, whatever options were out there, because they're starting to hear more and more about it in the news and starting to hear you know, how this could change the way I use electricity or get service in the future. So our board decided at that time to invest in solar. And so we have built a 500 kilowatt solar system with the help of today's power at a Little Rock, Arkansas, and Tesla battery storage. So we have both of those items on our campus. And it's, it really begins to show us how we could have a, a community, a community there that you know, potentially could be off-grid one day, depending on how technology progresses and, and what happens. Uh, but with our particular, or our particular campus right now, we have the 500 kilowatt solar array, uh, we have the Tesla battery backup system, and I'll show you some data on this in a minute to, to give you an idea of how that works. We also have a, a diesel generator as a backup, and then we have traditional grid power that comes in from two different substations. So the idea would be with that setup, this campus would never be offline. We could be running 24 seven, it would take a really big catastrophe for all of those things to fail. And so that, again, allows us to be able to be responsive and be available for our members, but it also begins to allow us to answer their questions about solar. Ray and I had a member come in, um, this is about two months ago, he was considering putting a solar array at his home, and so we were able to actually show him all of the data from our array to give him an idea of what we're producing, and then we can do the math, or Ray can do the math, scale that down and show him what it would take uh, for him to have solar at his home. And then he can make the decision economically, is this right for me at this time, or is it not? And as we all know in Oklahoma, we are very blessed to have affordable electric prices. Um, our, our utility and our energy prices are very low. Um, but we know that might all, not always be the case, and we know we might want to utilize some of this new technology. So again, that's why we have decided to move heavily into this area. So I'm not sure how well you can see that graph behind me. I know it's a little bit bright in this room. But this gives you an idea of what our solar produces. So the top line on this graph is 450 kilowatts. And this is three days of solar production in the month of April. And you see this bell curve that is, that is developed through the day. And so at about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that's when we hit our peak of solar production in April on this solar, solar array, which is about 450 kilowatts on this, at this particular time. When we built the building, our new headquarters facility that I just showed you, based on its size and its square footage and how that building was developed with traditional uh, uh, building uh, materials, it was estimated that at the peak, that building might reach 450 kilowatts, 500 kilowatts. And then typical usage, you know, 200 to 300 kilowatts. But because we built the building to gold lead certified standards and utilized every resource we could to make the building as efficient as we could, that building actually, and I, Ray, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the peak hasn't reached over 130 or 135. Yep, yep, so, so the building itself, where it was, <laughs> thank you. So the building itself, while traditionally it would have been a, a heavy load, because of those investments that were made, we created a very energy efficient space. So what you begin to see is that gap. So on the, the chart, the orange line, uh, the squiggly line at the bottom that's just under the 150 kilowatt mark, that's our campus. So that's the load for the entire campus. And then underneath it, the white line, which is hovering around the 100 kilowatt um, uh, line, is our building load. So what you can see here is this big gap that's being developed. And so our solar array over the last 12 months has produced more energy than it takes to operate the building over the, life, over the year of the building. And so we were net zero building, as Ray just said. So 
seeing this and seeing how it works, it really allows us to begin to tell that story. It really allows us to show on a commercial application how well this works. In fact, I love showing this. Um, this is actually a Facebook post we did. So if you go to, and I, I'm a marketer. I oversee our marketing and communications team. So this is my plug to go follow us on My Central Co at My Central Co-op. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of those places. But we did a Facebook post in August of 2017 during the solar eclipse that showed the solar production before the eclipse, during the eclipse, and after the eclipse. So you could see exactly how much the solar produced at each stage during the eclipse. And then you can also see, and I know, again, it's probably hard to see on this, but there's a green line, a squiggly line at the bottom. That's actually the battery storage. So during the start of the day, you can see where the solar production goes up, you see the building load in orange, and you see the green line start to charge. That's the battery storage. And then as the solar eclipse began to start and the solar production goes off to where it meets the building load, the battery storage then comes on and covers the building load during the eclipse. So at no time during the eclipse did we actually go back on to traditional uh, power resources. We were on the solar to start it, and then during the eclipse, we, came, uh, we used battery storage during that time. And then as the eclipse ended and the solar production came back up, um, the battery storage carries the building for a little bit longer, and then it drops back off to charge again and then to be used overnight. So she's closing the shade, so we'll see. I'll give it a minute to uh, see if that helps. Yeah. No, that's perfect. No, that's perfect. So again, um, I'll, just to show you again, so in fact, I'll read the post just for the information. Take a look at central solar production chart from yesterday during the eclipse. The red line shows central solar production. The green line shows central battery storage, filling the gap during the eclipse. The orange shaded area shows central uh, campus energy use. Our max solar production yesterday was 414 kilowatts. And at the peak of the eclipse, solar production dropped to only 43 kilowatts. So again, that gives you an idea of that the solar was actually still registering during the eclipse, but at much lower levels. Um, so that was an 89.6% reduction. At its peak, the moon blocked 87% of the sun in Stillwater, Oklahoma. So again, hopefully this gives you an illustration. I'll also go back to this chart so you can see it a little better. Again, this is some production numbers in April of this past year. So you can see that bell curve and you can see the difference between what the building and the campus load is at that time. And then you can see what the solar produces. So again, for a commercial application, in my mind, this is beginning to make a lot of sense uh, for our businesses, for, for where we're at during the middle of the day. Uh, this, this type of usage is making a lot of sense. Now, what about for residential though? None of us are home right now. In fact, most of us aren't home during the middle of the day. The solar is not producing, of course, at night. So is solar completely the answer for residential use? Maybe, maybe not. Again, battery storage is a, is a question there. The cost of, of being able to utilize battery storage is a question. Those are things that I think will become uh, more economical and we'll figure out over the next few years. Is that five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, who knows? But I, I think we'll start to see those applications become available at a residential level at some point. So this is an aerial view of our campus, just to give you an idea of, of where we're at. The blue dot um, on your left, so over here, that's our headquarters facility, our new facility in Stillwater. You see the solar array on the other side. Uh, we also use, utilize geothermal um, on our campus as well, so that's another uh, reason why we see that such a reduction of kilowatt usage at our campus. But what you also see is quite a bit of opportunity and quite a bit of land. We have the ability to scale the solar system up. So if we have individuals that want to take part in what we're doing on our campus and want to move onto our campus, they would actually have the ability to interconnect into that solar and begin to use the same services we have um, at Central Electric at our headquarters uh, facility. Uh, we actually have a property where our old building was located. That's um, We're not actively looking for a tenant right now, but if the right tenant came along and somebody we wanted to partner with, uh, we do want to talk to those individuals. So I don't want to step on any toes here in Tulsa, if anybody from the chamber or city of Tulsa is here, but if you're looking maybe to expand outside of Tulsa and want to look at a place like Stillwater, Oklahoma, this could be a place for you. And it's a place where you could 
begin to see how solar would work for your business or, or, or whatever it is that you may be interested in. Also, um, on the top of the screen at the intersection of Boomer and 32nd, there's actually an old gas station there. That property is now for sale. So again, if somebody's looking for an uh, opportunity to do some, some development or do something new with that property, that property is now for sale. So we're talking with our local chamber, we're talking with other businesses about an opportunity to move onto this campus and to begin seeing the benefits of using technology like solar. So a big part of what we're trying to do is trying to educate our members and trying to share this information with them. Um, because again, that's, and at the end I'll talk a little bit more about the seven cooperative principles, but one of them is education and training and really sharing how we use solar on our campus and how you may be able to re, uh, use renewables uh, at your home. But we also want to share that renewables are already a part of your energy mix. Um, like all utilities, we do have renewables in our energy mix. We are a part of Associated Electric Cooperative based in Springfield, Missouri, and that's who generates our power. Camo Power based out of Anita then transmits it to our substations and then we distribute it out to our members. And with our energy mix currently that our members get from us, it's 63% coal, 19% natural gas, 12% wind, and 6% hydro. So we share that information with our members so they know that at least a portion of their energy use already is coming from renewables. And we also want them to know that we're hoping those numbers go up. We're hoping we'll see higher usage of those renewable resources in the future as they become less expensive, as they become a better um, option for our members. And I, I highlight that because as electric co-op, we're not alone in this battle. Um, co-ops are independent and autonomous from each other, but we also work closely together on initiative. Electric co-ops actually cover 56% of the nation's land mass. So we have a large area that we serve, and we have the ability in that area to be innovative. We have the ability in that area to find new ways to serve our membership and to help them, if renewables is what they want, help them begin to utilize that service um, inside uh, their, their use. And I mentioned earlier Associated Electric co co uh, Cooperative, who we uh, get our power from, they are currently investing heavily into wind and hydro. So they are trying to, again, get that energy mix up, get more and more people, or more and more use of renewables in the energy mix. So again, when we distribute that to you, the member, you have that as an option in your energy mix. Western Farmers is another uh, generation uh, company that's here based in Oklahoma. They actually serve a lot of Western Oklahoma, Southern Oklahoma. Um, they're heavily investing into solar. So they are working with their co-ops to begin utilizing solar more in their generation. So. Our industry is really trying to embrace and adopt renewables as much as we can, but it's always a, a fine line because, as you all know, and, and you all may, may battle in your conversations with your companies or, or at home or whatever the case may be, um, you've got to do, make the right choice economically. You've got to make the right choice for the bottom line as well. Uh, so for us as an electric co-op, we have to listen to our members. We talk a lot about doing what's best for the membership as a whole, but also listening to the individual voice of one member. So that way we're getting all the input that we need to hear and, and all the information we wanna know so we can make the best decisions for membership as a whole. But if a third of your membership is really wanting you to invest heavily in renewables, really wanting you to move in that direction, but two thirds of your membership are not, how do you weigh that battle? How do you have those conversations? How do you continue to educate your members to, to the options they have out there and allow them to make the best choice and allow them to tell us and our board, this is what we want you to do. So again, a big part of that is engaging in our communities. And we like to use the term empowering our communities. So we have 28 communities, again, that we serve. I told you earlier that it's, it ranges from a small town in Logan County called Meridian, Oklahoma, uh, to places like Oklahoma City, Edmond. Again, we serve a little bit inside the city of Stillwater and really trying to engage with our communities to let them know what we're learning, to let them know what we're engaging in. So that way they hopefully have a better idea of, of things that they should be looking at and things they should be doing. An example of this is youth. We're very passionate about helping educate the youth in our area about renewables, 
about safety with electricity, about how the energy mix works. These are a couple of examples of our linemen going to uh, uh, schools in our area. Um, one of these locations, Corey mentioned earlier, I serve on the board of directors for the Oklahoma One Auditorium. We're a children's museum that's based in Stillwater. We'd love to have you come over and visit us. We're looking to move into a new location in the near future, but we like to go to places like that and give not only information about electrical safety, but also what we're learning about renewables and how those work. And what's interesting or what we see is somebody who's 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, none of this impresses them. None of this surprises them. They expect it. They crave it. They want it. They know this is the future. Um, I mentioned earlier, Ray and I drove over in a Tesla today. Um, we've had that uh, car in several parades in, in Stillwater and some of the other communities. And it's interesting that the kids all know what that car is, and some adults don't because they really start to embrace it. They want to learn more about it. They want to be a part of it. So we're trying to engage youth. We have them on our campus. We do whatever we can to really educate them about renewables, about traditional power as well, and about safety. We also like to work with our communities as much as we can. Um, in one of these pictures, it would be on your left, upper left-hand side. We did an effort in Stillwater. It was called Smart Community Source. And again, the effort in that was to engage the community, have them come in to begin talking about renewables, have them come in and begin talking about new technologies and how this is gonna affect the way we develop cities, how this is gonna affect the way in the future uh, people want to use um, their communities and want services from those communities. And so that was, a, again, um, an effort to really engage with them and really allow them to give us feedback too and learn more about uh, what we do with electric co-ops. We also have a service called Operation Roundup where our members have the ability to round their bill up to the nearest dollar. And we have a board of directors that then decides on uh, initiatives to give those funds back to. And we've been doing that service for about 12 years now. And to this date, members at Central Electric Cooperative have been able to give over half a million dollars back to these communities through that program. So again, just another way for us to try to give back and try to help our communities. Because we know that communities to be successful, and for us as an electric co-op to be successful, they need to thrive. And I'm, a, I'm an early millennial or a late Gen Xer, depending on, on how, you, how you classify or what year you were born. And you know something that really has changed our rural, rural communities, maybe even more than we ever know, is this, information. I'm holding up a cell phone, but it really is all about data. In my generation, has started to leave rural America because we want to have access to this. I mentioned my parents earlier. They live in Tulsa part-time. They also have the family farm that I grew up on in southwestern Payne County. It's almost 2020, and when we go, go visit them on the weekends or I call them to check in and they're at home, sometimes I can't get them on the phone because it's poor cell service. They want to cut the satellite dish and go to streaming services, but they actually don't have reliable internet access where they live. And so... My generation looks at that and goes, why in the world would I want to live there if I can't have this, if I can't have access to all of this? So at Electric Co-ops, another effort we're getting involved is, or a lot of co-ops are, in fact, I was at East Central's meeting, um, annual meeting last week in Okmulgee. They're getting into a broadband effort. So we're seeing how electric co-ops may be able to help in, in internet access in rural America. We're also beginning a program called Main Street Makeover through Touchstone Energy. And I have some staff members going to this uh, conference next week in Des Moines, Iowa to learn more about this program. And again, hopefully it's going to be a way for us to engage in rural communities. And you may think if you live here in Tulsa, you know, how is this important to me? I know in Stillwater, sometimes we get that question about smaller communities around. But if those communities are strong, the larger communities that support them are going to be strong. If those communities are strong, the businesses in that area are gonna be strong. So we are very passionate about rural America and trying to help develop rural America. So this is a program you'll hopefully see more of in the future as we begin to roll out. And as I end, it, it's again all about the seven cooperative principles and what we're doing. Voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, members economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training and information, cooperation among cooperatives and concern for community. It's actually so important to us at Central Electric on our executive team and on our board of directors. We carry that in our wallets. Um, so I have a card that I carry everywhere with me that has those seven co-op principles. 
So when I'm trying to make a decision for the co-op, I refer back to these to try to help me make the best decision I can for our membership as a whole and our co-op as a whole. And that's, again, why we go back to why did we invest in solar? Why did we invest in some of the tools and technologies that we have today? And a big part of that goes back to these seven cooperative principles and how we want to give back and help our communities and how to educate to use these tools in the future. So Ray and I will stick around for as long as you guys want us to. If you have any questions about the solar array or, as Corey mentioned, if you would like to come and visit us in Stillwater, we'd love to have you come, uh, come over and we'd love to show you the solar array, the Tesla battery storage. Um, again, we're, we've used UAV technology in our campus and have invested heavily, invested heavily in that. And then again, if you're looking for space to develop or, or move outside of Tulsa and you think Stillwater, Oklahoma may be a good place, give me a call. We'd love to talk to you about our campus and see how that might be a fit for you as well. So again, thank you very much. And Ray and I will stick around as long as you guys have questions. So thank you all. Hi, guys. We're going to pass the mic to our booth vendors over here really quickly, and then we'll uh, do a couple questions. And then we also have a giveaway today. So give us just a moment. I'm Nancy Graham. I am the Air Quality Program Manager with INCOG, which is the Regional Council of Governments. Hi, I'm Emily Smith, also from INCOG. Um, I help run a Department of Energy program called Tulsa Clean Cities. We handle everything alternative fuels. Hi, I'm Mary Foley, and I work with PSO and ICF, and we market uh, PSO's energy efficiency rebate programs. Carrie Rowland with PSO, and a big shout out today to Tyson, who signed up 100% win choice. Thank you, Tyson. He said it was very, very easy. It was just two clicks, and he was in. So everyone go, go for it. I'm Dustin Jaggers with the City of Tulsa Stormwater Quality Department. We have an education program called Save Our Streams, where we educate citizens on storm uh, storm drain and watershed pollution. Uh, a couple other things that we do is we actually monitor all the creeks and streams in Tulsa for that pollution to find out what's happening in Tulsa and then create education to let you all know about it. Hello, I'm Levin Escoto with the City of Tulsa. Um, we're coming with the program for refuse and recycling. If you have any question, what you're supposed to recycle and, and what do you supposed to put into the in your blue recycling car, please come and let me know. And hi, everyone. <laughs> Okay, coming back. So uh, they're going to pass the mics around. If you guys have any questions, um, raise your hand. And we've got Susan has one right there. And I may Ray, if you if you want to come up and join me, you're more than welcome to. Come on up. And Ray or I can help answer your question. Yeah. Susan, go ahead. Thanks. So Susan Crenshaw, um, Energy Manager for One Oak. We're one of your customers. Thanks mm -hmm. for being reliable and good service. Uh, two questions. One, what's your overall connected load? Um, just kind of on a like peak for the year, so whether it's yeah. winter or summer. Yeah. Second question, I know one thing that I have learned and has been really interesting for me in Oklahoma is um, just kind of overall amount of our bills with cooperatives that kind of go back to the local communities. Yeah. And there's a couple of avenues that happens, if you could share on that. Absolutely. So our peak load for the year, no, no worries. Um, our peak load for the year was 131 megawatts. That occurred back in March uh, during one of our colder spells in early March. Um, and you guys probably all know this. For me, it was a surprise. I was like, how does a peak load happen in the winter months? That's just, you know. Again, not coming from the electric utility industry, I was like, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And we, we normally peak in the winter. Um, and so 131 megawatts was our peak load uh, this year. If you don't know the answer like I didn't, you know, the simplest explanation is if you have your thermostat on 70 or a total electric home, in the summertime, if it's 100 degrees outside, that's a 30 degree difference. If it's in the wintertime and it's 20 degrees outside, that's a 50 degree difference. And I was like, oh yeah, light bulb. So yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. So, um, so that was our, our peak load for the year. And again, that happened in March. And then I loved you asked that question about concern for community and giving back to the communities. And um, so we do that through a couple of different ways. I mentioned Operation Roundup, which is directly from our members. And so for less than 12 bucks a year, and we have 60% of our members that, that participate in this program, most of them from the residential side, uh, but we do have several commercial businesses that do as well. 
And so those funds are, are again, your bill is rounded up to the nearest dollar. Those funds go into a foundation. And then we have, our board has appointed members to serve on a uh, foundation board and they uh, get grant applications in six times a year. You do not have to be a member to actually participate in this program. It will do it for anybody who's inside of our service area. And those funds go to anything from schools, churches, uh, communities asking for help. Um, the Coyle School Foundation, which is a, a board of directors that I serve on, prior to me coming to Central, we actually benefited from the foundation and the members' generosity a few times uh, through that program. But that program has given over a half million dollars back to the community since 2007. And then as well, we also have our traditional marketing and, and communication um, uh, budget, and we try our best to really show how we give back to communities through sponsoring events, anything from a little league tournament to things that go on at Oklahoma State University and Langston University. We're very blessed to have two institutions of higher learning that we actually both serve. And um, so being able to engage with them and help with them in any way we can, uh, and then to help individuals back. Um, through our grant program, we actually do disaster relief. So during the flooding that occurred a few months ago, we will probably have several grant applications come through from people that maybe FEMA or insurance couldn't quite cover everything they needed. And so that's a place that they can, again, come back to us and ask, hey, I need, I need this. Is this something you can help provide? So those are ways that, that we try to give back to our communities and try to show that we're a part of that community and want to help, uh, help our membership and help our non-members even inside our service area. Hello, uh, John Sayre with Structural Solutions. I've got two questions. I couldn't see on the uh, screen there, so, sorry. But the footprint for your 500 kilowatt system, uh, what is the footprint of the solar? And what is the footprint of the battery storage? The battery storage is very small. It's a modular, uh, comparatively, it's about, I would suspect, probably 20 foot by maybe 12 feet in a actually a, and it's a 250 kW system that is modular that can be expanded. We have found now that we wish we had put a megawatt of batteries in to uh, compensate for our solar production. Our solar is about 1260 panels, roughly acre and a half, yep, maybe acre two half, acres, yep. something like that. Um, it is dark earth. There's nothing under it. It's got gra gravel and mm -hmm. we make sure no weeds not much weed. You think I really need this? <laughs> I can whisper they can hear me in three counties, but uh, but no, it's 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 a it's a very and one thing Daniel did allude to is on our uh, gold lead certification is the geothermal aspect of it. We have VFD drives on our loops, and uh, we actually have 98 385 foot wells that are just east. You can't see just east of that solar array. And we actually have them GPSed as well. And we have a secondary loop that comes off our SOC that is in that parking lot on the upper right. And we GPS those locations. Uh, typically, the installation is good on geos, but you still need to know where the wells are in case you got to get in. So we GPS. Our GIS people did that. I can talk the legs off a chair, so be careful. <laughs> he really can. He's not lying. Um, I wanted to know what the uh, projected, I guess, return on your investment is on that solar array. We base that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. We, yeah. base, we base that on the 25-year uh, life on the levelized cost of energy. The paybacks weren't good to about the 12-year range. Uh, then they really accelerated out. And that's one thing that you need to look at. The economics may not be first in right now. But look at the 2% inflation rate of energy over the life of the system, mm -hmm. and that's where you get economic value. It's, I, I, first question I ask on people when they come to me is I ask, why do you want to go renewable? You'll have, oh, I, I'm tired of paying my utility company. Well, you probably don't need to really look at taking a, anyway. There's a lot of different reasons people go renewable, and we want to make sure we fit that reasoning. Um, economics, uh, environmental impacts, mm -hmm. good stewardship. There's a lot of different reasons than just economics. Yeah. 
Did that help? Yes. Okay. One more yes. Oh, we have two hands. Oh, two hands. Okay. Quick, quick. Yeah, we can quick. do two. Yeah. Quick. Quick. Um, I have a question regarding like the storage potential for the future. If we were all to switch over to solar, mm -hmm. um, I've heard that the storage uh, device that we have, it's not efficient enough and mm -hmm. it's not going to be sustainable. Is that something that you guys are addressing? And the other question is, what effect uh, would switching over to all these solar panels on our buildings have on like the heat island effect? Hmm. You want to tackle that one? Two part? Yeah. Kind of. Um, <laughs> the impacts on resident individual solar, I'm going to address that one first, benefits every member on our system. Because what it does is it reduces the wholesale cost of power to the utility, and that benefits everybody on our system. That's one of the reasons we're an advocate to help people. What we want to do is make sure that they have the right information to make that decision, um, knowing that it is pretty cost inhibitive. And one of the things that I really focus on people is moving them to a renewable aspect. Maybe solar isn't the deal, but geo is. You know, kind of same feds, same, same tax, but anyway, that's kind of, and what was your first? Uh, about the, the storage potential. The storage potential, uh, I see battery technology advancing as we go forward. It has increased over time since we put our system mm -hmm. in. One thing about it is right now, even with the lithium technology, it does have a discharge plateau, I guess you could say, that if you pull over that, it reduces your battery life. So you really want to gauge your systems to where it doesn't impact it, so you get the longevity and sustainability out of your systems. Did that, did that help? Yep. And yeah, one more question okay. right here. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Do you have a plan for reducing your coal, and what is that plan, and what do you think 25 years from now you'll be using for source? Great question. Um, so we are always engaging with our generation uh, uh, cooperative that we use associated and having those conversations with them you know it's it's hard for me to project and ray might have some some ideas on years and, and what he thinks you know when does that happen uh, and again for me it goes back to and, and when i'm co having conversations with members about this you know if if a small group of your membership are really advocating for this the majority are not how do you balance that and but I do see through the generation cooperatives and through having more renewables in that mix, I see that as an answer in the future. Um, we do have a lot of assets already out in the field. There's already a lot of poles and wires out there. So for us to be able to get more renewables through that avenue uh, would be a very cost effective way to do that without sacrificing the current um, infrastructure that's out there. Now Ray and I actually had a conversation about this on the way up, so he might even share a different opinion on it. but. Um, but that's one, one thing we're looking at with our generation uh, co-op is, is how does that, how, do, how economically can we make it to improve those renewables so we can still keep rates low and still keep rates affordable, but make that a part of our mix. One, one of the things that I'd had conversations with some of our members even, and I actually sat on the board of OREC, Oklahoma Renewable Energy Council, and we've had discussions going back and forth, and, and some people say, well, when is associated going to get off coal? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we're moving to that direction, but what have you done? What is the position you have taken on renewables? Have you put solar in on your home? Have you put wind? Have you put batteries? Something, because I think it personally takes a individual step and stance and moving in that direction to be able to renewables. I envision the day that Alexa which we all know about Alexa, actually takes choices and makes the choices behind the scenes on what is our utility provider at that time of day. That's what I see in the future, where we have a seamless integration of every generation asset and capabilities available in America. Um, and it's all seamless, where we will actually choose the least expensive at that time of day uh, going forward. Okay, I think we're there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Let's give Daniel and Ray another round of applause. Very, very interesting information. And I definitely encourage you to head over to Stillwater and take a look at it. Um, 
and thank you for the questions that you had as well. I, I do want to make two quick announcements that I forgot in the very beginning. One, happy birthday to Michael Patton. Everybody say, happy birthday. Woo -hoo -hoo. He's 39 today. Um, and I also want to say, this is Jill Mods. She's our second longest serving employee. It's her one year anniversary. Woo -hoo -hoo. We love having her on the team. Okay, we're, we're a little past time, so we're gonna, we have just two drawings uh, for these beautiful mugs here. What's the same old toss on them? They're the and best. And who are these, uh, who are the lucky people today, Megan? I don't know. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Troy, come on down from American Ways. Woo woo, you're the lucky guy today. And, oh, okay. And, Seuss, you're the lucky guy today from Muskogee Creek Nation. All right. Thank you all so much. Stick around and visit some more. We love having you here. We'll see you next month.